are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Well, welcome back to the Sense of Beer Style uh, with my my good beer friend, Julia Hers. How are you doing today, Julia? I'm doing great. Great mood. Very excited and ready to get going on these Irish stouts. This one, you know, every, I'm excited about every one of these. And, you know, I'll be honest, some I'm more excited about than others. This one is just fun because I get to be, a, you know, a, a little bit geeky besides beer geeky. Um, because of this episode, we decided to add an extra prepisode to talk all about nitro, nitrogen gas, what it is, how to use it, how to experience it. So make sure you go back to our uh, new prepisode talking about uh, nitro, because today we're going to talk about Irish stouts. We're and we're going to combine. Excuse me. We're going to uh, talk about. Irish stout and Irish extra stout. Those are those are different enough where they have their own subcategory, but today we're going to talk about them together because they, for all intent and purpose, they are a step of each other. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into that. But the thing I love about Irish stout and and we're gonna you know there are plenty of Irish stouts out there. We're gonna talk about uh, Murphy's in just a second, but this this style really started with the British porters and then the British stout porters, which became British stouts. And then along the line, uh, Ireland want to get in uh, on the mix as well. And and Guinness began. And Guinness has an incredible uh, an incredible story. There's a book out there uh, called Of God and Guinness, and it's just the story uh, of of Guinness. And, and it was, it's a fantastic read. The, the story is just phenomenal. All the things that they did were far ahead of their time. And it was just interesting to me that around the time that Pilsners were traveling around the world and dominating the world, so were Irish Stouts. It seemed like, you know, the, the two paths went, uh, went their own way. Um, uh, but the, the discussion of uh, these days, when we think about Irish Stout, most of us immediately go to Guinness uh, uh, from um, Dublin. But there's also uh, Murphy's from County Cork, and we're going to talk about the differences there when we get to the the style difference because both of them are lovely, but they're very different. Uh, so let, let's, uh, without further ado, Julia, let's talk about the ingredients. Fantastic, and the ingredients are going to bring you to a uh, dark roasted influence style beer. For the Irish uh, stout and the Irish extra stout, they're not going to be barrel you over in ABV or alcohol. They're going to be a stepping stone towards the heavier stouts that we will cover in other style casts for sure. Um, and characteristic ingredients are dark roasted malts and grains. Um, the beer is really generally black in color. And then you have pale malt as the base fermentable to give you those the alcohol, the more sessionable alcohol. And then unmalted roasted grains will give you some body, will also give you some uh, color and texture to the collar of foam. Most of these stouts you will see classically do not have ivory white collars of foam. They do have that, that tan um, ivory, um, or, or not ivory, but more tan colored collar of foam from unroasted malted barley and flaked malts. And you've got some grippy tannins in there because you've got the higher uh, roasted malts being used and you've got these uh, unmalted grains often being used. You've got some grippiness, some tannins, some um, think California reds. I always compare it to that, you know, put in a mm -hmm. fresh oak barrel. You've got some of those tannins. And then it, you're going to also get uh, surprised by sometimes how bitter this style is. This, this style doesn't set out to be a high IBU or international bitterness beer. 
Um, but because the finish is drier and often lower in final gravity, you don't have as much residual sugar to be balanced by the bitterness. And the bitterness comes from both the bittering hops and also those darker roasted malts that bring that astringency and bitterness to the equation. And then they're fermented with ale yeast, right? And then if you yeah. go from Irish um, stout to Irish extra stout, really the biggest nuance difference is that for the Irish extra stout, you may have additional dark crystal malts or dark sugars that are added to that version of this stout. It, and that's one of the fun things, uh, you know, whenever I've had a, an Irish stout that it was not on nitro, uh, I, I find I don't enjoy it as much because of those tannins, because of those roasted malts. It, it tends to be a little bit more, no, a lot more grippy on my palate. And, and I just love that smooth slickness that comes with it. Um, but before, actually, before I talk about appearance with your blessing, I'm going to add something to this that we don't talk about in, in most other styles. I'm going to talk about the auditory and I've got, uh, a can of Guinness draft with a, a nitro widget inside. Love it. And, and most of us are like Pavlovian dogs. We hear that little, psh, you know, of a can or a bottle and, and we're, we know something good is coming, but I, but for those of you watching or listening, I, I, I want you to listen to this and notice how it's a little bit different. Did you notice how there was that crack and then there was that secondary fizz? That is an indicator of that that beer has a nitro widget on the inside. And so there was a primary release of pressure and a secondary release of nitro. So as I pour this into my glass, and most of us have had a nitro beer, and this is the fun part. This is where the appearance uh, comes in. And so if you're listening to this, then I have basically a glass of what looks like chocolate milk with uh, with uh, black on the bottom, but it's cascading and it's settling and it's and that uh, tan head that you were just talking about a minute ago is forming. And, and if you've never seen a nitro beer cascade like this, it, it's it's part of the show. It's part of the performance. So what we should expect is to have that cascade. It should be poured properly, either can or from draft but we should have this deep brown uh, to black color is what really what we're looking for. And if you hold this up to the light and you look at just the edges of your glass, you'll notice that this, this beer is actually not brown. It's actually not black. It's actually a deep garnet red. But when we look, if you had it in a very, very thin glass, uh, then you'd, you'd see the more red. But uh, because it's in a bigger glass, we see that it actually comes out looking very dark. Um, uh, because it's so dark, therefore it's opaque. It's hard to tell clarity, uh, but you should have this, this, uh, I call it a desert khaki, uh, very light khaki colored foam. It's very dense. It should last as long as you're drinking that beer for the, for the most part. Uh, when it, when it's served on nitro, they do have, uh, Irish stouts and other stouts like this that are not served on nitro. Uh, it won't have the same effect. But we are talking about Irish stouts, so I'm just going to assume 99% uh, of the time it should be on nitro. So that's what the beer should sound like, should look like uh, w within the Irish stout category. And it's definitely I've art. I mean, the, 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 the whole demonstration and presentation and that stable collar of foam, that collar of foam will be very long lasting and remain yep. stable. It's just so inviting. It, it makes you want to sit down and sit in front of a fire, whether it's summer or winter, and sip and drink and be warm and cozy. And it's kind of like that comfort food feel that when we think of our favorite comfort food dishes in your mind, you elicit that, that I'm warm, I'm comfortable and happy. And that's what the appearance absolutely looks like. And I love it. Um, we're talking about Irish Stout and Irish Extra Stout as part of Beer Judge Certification Program 2021 Style Guidelines for Irish Irish ales. And so, can I dive into aroma, Jeremy? While you're, while Abs you're oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm right I'm, on. I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate proper technique over here. Right, and you could <laughs> even have a, a mustache from that collar of foam that would that would politely um, showcase <laughs> that you are enjoying the glass if you if you want. Absolutely. Um, an aroma for the two styles, right? Irish style, then Irish extra style, just only going to be a little nuanced difference. Both of them are going to basically have, you know, moderate coffee-like aroma um, that dominates. And if you go to the Irish extra style, it could be moderately high, 
coffee-like aroma that dominates. Then you've got essence of dark chocolate, cocoa, right, in the Irish ale. And then if you get to Irish extra stout, you're going to add dark chocolate um, on top of that is biscuit, vanilla, um, even more of those dark chocolate notes. Uh, and you've got medium to low esters in both examples of these styles. That's from the ales. That is optional. You might get an essence of esters, which could be those kind of unripe uh, red fruits or the like from the ale yeast. And then low earthy or floral hop aroma is optional for both of these styles. That would come from the English ale yeast. But again, um, we would more so talk about the hops in terms of the flavor that Jeremy will overview when we mm -hmm. get to that aspect of it. Um, but it really is a uh, a beer that is going to smell different because you don't have a lot of the prickle of the CO2, the carbon dioxide, volatizing out of the glass. I often get a little in my nasal passages when I'm, I'm smelling a beer that's been only influenced by CO2 or carbon dioxide, a nasal um, passage like prickle, right? A little sting. Um, and you're not going to get that from this. You might get a little ethanol, but the, again, this is, these are pretty sessionable styles from there. I'm really excited, though, to dive into the flavor, Jeremy. Yeah. The funny thing is, Julia, is uh, yesterday I bought some Girl Scout cookies. And and I love the the ones with the, they, they used to be called Samoas, but they're the ones with the coconut and the caramel and the chocolate. Of course, you got to get Thin Mints because they're great with peanut butter, but that's a different story. And, you know, when I smelled these beers, uh, so I'm holding, I've got the uh, extra stout right here, and I've got the the Guinness draft. Um, you know, the, the flavor is slightly different. The the, the export uh, is uh, is just a little bit more intense, but but I get that that sense of of like dark chocolate Girl Scout cookies in there. There's there's that bread, sweet breadiness that you mentioned vanilla. Um uh, the, you know, you can have like this dark cocoa, uh, and it's not common to have very much, um, caramel or toffee in there, but sometimes I get a hint of it in there. Um, uh, but, but uh, and that's just, uh, sorry, I got distracted because of this beer again. Uh, that's just the, uh, the esters that can come through, uh, so that it's a very malt forward style, but it's balanced, not necessarily by alcohol and Irish stout. It's a pretty low uh, alcohol there, but it's balanced by uh, these esters, a, a little bit of that uh, roast uh, that can come through, and as a, and a low hop uh, bitterness can come through. Uh, but it's not necessarily about the hops. It's about the hops and the roast and the and the texture and the dryness kind of adds to balancing all this beautiful malt. And when it's done on nitro, any of those harsher, acrid, roasty flavors that are a little aggressive, those are smoothed out. Those are mellowed out, and everything is just like a wonderful Girl Scout cookie. That, and that's that's my take on flavor. Yeah, and you're triggering into mouthfeel, and I did that too. We were talking earlier about the astringency. The mouthfeel is going to be a little different for both styles because, again, it's that steps up a ladder, right? And your Irish stout compared to Irish extra stout is just going to be a little less intense. So the mouthfeel for the Irish um, stout is more light to medium full body, um, where Irish extra stout is moderately high uh, or medium to moderately high body. So there's a little difference and you're kind of stepping up that ladder. Um, you've got uh, moderate carbonation in the Irish extra stout and in, in the, um, the lesser version of, of just your Irish stout. You've basically got low to moderate carbonation. So it might be uh, if you just start with the Irish stout a little less carbonated than the Irish extra stout. Um, you might get a little astringency. So we're certainly continuing to uh, talk about that, but it should never be harsh, right? Um, never undesirable. Um, but it's very approachable mouthfeel. And then as you get to the Irish extra stout, you might actually get a sense of a warming character as the style guidelines reference, or, you know, a little bit of a detectable ethanol that's, um, that's, that's more noticeable than its lesser brother or sister version. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to comparing these two different stouts or different styles, uh, you know, they're very different. Of course, it's easy to say that, oh, these must be a lot like, uh, porters or stouts from uh, England, just you know, right across the water, uh, and they're actually really quite different. Um, excuse me, with the with the uh, uh, 
British stouts, British porters uh, tend to be a little bit more malt forward or more round in the mouthfeel. These tend to be even more uh, acrid, even more roasty, but much drier and, and, uh, and, you know, kind of lower in body too. I've noticed, uh, particularly the Irish stout, uh, it, it's people always think it's a big chewy beer. It's actually thin and wispy, uh, with a lot of flavor. If you really come down to it and, and you mentioned this earlier, it's very sessionable. So there's not a ton of residual sugar. There's a lot of flavor, but there's not a ton of residual sugar in the mouthfeel and it finishes, uh, clean and light with the, the, uh, the extra stout, uh, it's just going to be, uh, bigger, uh, just a little bit a bigger mouthfeel, uh, which is kind of obvious to say, but, uh, but with the, uh, Irish extra stout, uh, you know, and compared to each other, they're both very, very similar. They're both, uh, from the same family, but the extra stout is just going to have more body, uh, richer, a little bit more complexity, uh, and, you know, maybe a little bit more alcohol, uh, you know, you'll notice more alcohol is definitely gonna have more alcohol. Uh, but there, there's just like the, the, the bigger sibling, uh, to each other. Uh, and that's the best way to describe these with the style comparisons. What about, uh, commercial examples We're, we've already talked about a couple. Yep. And um, I'll give you commercial examples, which are great because if you sit for Cicerone at some point, you probably will be served, uh, one of these examples. If you are studying your beer styles and can't nail a uh, blind, tasting it blind, an Irish stout, then you're not completely done with your beer studies. So mm -hmm. when you do your commercial examples to calibrate and study, um, on the Irish stout side, you know, Beamish really comes up a lot. Bellhaven, uh, Black Stout is very prominent. Guinness certainly helped establish it. So look for the Guinness draft. You've also got Murphy's Irish Stout, O'Hare's mm -hmm. Irish Stout, uh, the style guidelines reference Porterhouse Irish Stout. And then when you get to the Irish Extra Stout, again, that second style example within this grouping of Irish beers, you've got some of the same producers producing their version of that Irish Extra Stout, Guinness Extra Stout, right? The word extra is in there. O'Hare's um, has a version, Porterhouse XXXX, meaning extra, mm -hmm. extra, extra, extra. <laughs> and then Sheaf Stout yep. comes up with their own example. So they're there. They are often exported out of um, the... Uh, you know, Ireland, and frankly, the biggest export of Ireland is Guinness, based on the statistics that I've read. Uh, it's not potatoes. It's not Bono and U2. It is huh. definitely Guinness. And so you're going to find this beer also brewed in many locations across the world because Guinness is part of now an amazing brewing empire, uh, not just one location where it started. So you will, won't have too hard of a time following it. And then the really easy cheat to help you when you blind taste is what Jeremy's about to overview for us. So Jeremy, share with us the vital statistics so our brains can get the difference between the two and what we're looking for. Yeah, you know, and, and I thought because you just uh, talked about some of the commercial examples, I thought it might be worth interjecting real quick, if I may. Um, the the stories I've heard from people who have been there that it, it's uh, remember those old commercials uh, about Miller Lite back in the uh, early 80s. Taste great, less filling, taste great, sure. less filling. They're talking mm -hmm. about the same thing, but they're looking at it from two different points of view The I've heard that uh, the same type of. Uh, rivalry exists between Guinness and Murphy's Guinness and Murphy's and, and, and what, what's your experience with the difference between those two? Well, rivalry wise, I only can go off of my beer studies, what I've read and, and seen for advertisements. Um, and I do think that it's a fair example. That's not us based, uh, beer is business people. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. you, you get the best business by creating controversy and positioning yourself. And one thing that Guinness at least let in, um, that many others, uh, tried to follow, um, and in, in some areas it became not uh, legal to do it was talk about drinking this in healthful ways. And in the United States, for example, you are not allowed to make healthful claims on your beer labels or advertisements about your beer. You'll see the wild west of wellness is different than health, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. But, you know, from 1950s and when the nitrogenated um, aspect got really going for Guinness and Guinness started to fly then and export a lot more. 
you see advertisements, old school ones of pregnant women drinking Guinness and they're advertising that it's healthy for you and your your baby that you're busy cooking in the oven, so to speak. <laughs> so yeah, rivalries uh, abound, but I would say that Guinness has definitely um, the, had the most dollars behind them and the most longest standing leadership behind establishing this style and teaching us all thinking about it brand Irish stout in in um, most ways really do trace back to Guinness. It, it, but and this is what makes the idea of styles uh, a, a loose uh, a, a, or a wide target. Let's put it that way. Because um, when we think about Irish stout, most of us immediately go to Guinness. But when we when we bring Murphy's into the mix, if you ever have a chance to try a Murphy's Irish stout, and if you try them side by side, they're very, very different beers. A Murphy's uh, tends to be a fuller body, tends to be sweeter and not quite as as bitter and acrid. And 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 I'm going to use the word burnt. Uh, there are some burnt flavors that pe- that we can detect in the in the Guinness. And Murphy's is is a lot uh, bigger, sweeter, easier from that standpoint. Uh, and, and so, but what we're talking about, this is Irish stout and there's two different, uh, uh, points of view on this. So, um, uh, so keep in mind, you know, we, we've, been, we've talked about this in every style cast that, you know, these styles are just the center of the bullseye, but there are concentric rings around the bullseye that still occupy that same style. And so, uh, this one, uh, the Irish stout, category really helps us understand that there are different interpretations of the same idea. And so I, I wanted to pull that out real quick too. Uh, but let's let's talk about numbers now that we've uh, waxed poetic and tasted some wonderful beer. The Irish stout, the, uh, the, 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 the standard, the base, we're, uh, let's start with the, the ABV. Uh, that's, that's really where we're going to land most of the time when we're thinking about it. This can be 3.8 up to 5, uh, 5 ABV. In the previous guidelines, it was up to 4.5. It topped out at 4.5. So for those of you who think that Irish stats are big and chewy, these are sessionable. These are easy drinking. Uh, and when we get to the Irish extra stout, it's just a step. Uh, the Irish stout goes 3.8 to 5. The extra goes 5 to 6.5. That's the one that's bigger and, and frankly, uh, of normal or average strength. Uh, but it's the Irish stout that is below average uh, on the strength. Um, IBUs, we're talking uh, 25 to 45 for the Irish. So there's enough hops in there where you can taste some, um, some hoppiness, some hop bitterness, some hop flavor. Um, but notice how, you know, again, I'm the visual learner. So I think about how these overlap visually. So if the Irish stout is 25 to 45, the extra stout is 35 to 50. So it, it's just a slight shift upward in the IBU scale. Um, but 50 is, is pretty pretty prominent. So you, you can expect some hops. But remember, extra stout, uh, extra sometimes also uh, uh, is reminiscent of export. So they're thinking about we're going to send this somewhere. So we need to add a little extra in there. Uh, so the SRM, uh, we talked about this, it can be from brown to black. Uh, so that puts it squarely in the 25 to 40 uh, for Irish stout. If you're an EBC person, uh, we're roughly 50 to 80. Um, and that uh, pretty much rings true with the extra stout as well, 30 to 40 for SRM, but uh, that we're splitting uh, hairs there. European Original... Brewing Convention, meaning EBC. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the Brewers Association World Beer Style Guidelines for the World Beer Cup and Great American Beer Festival, they've got EBC at 80 plus. So they're yeah. really taking it to kind of that black opaque level. Yeah, it, which, which, you know, from from a practical standpoint, black is black. But from a uh, technical standpoint, uh, the 80 plus is blacker than black. We're talking like super black. There's There's like a shadow. There's uh, there's a dark alleyway, and then there's that scary room in that horror movie that you just like you know you don't want the uh, lead character to go in. So we're talking different categories of black, Absolutely. or as Batman would say, uh, I only work in black or really really dark gray. Uh, so so that's kind of what we're talking about there. Uh, original gravities for Irish Stout, ten thirty six to ten forty four. That's not not a big beer. Uh, and it's going to uh, finish out at ten oh seven, ten eleven. Again, that's skirting a more on the lighter body side. 
uh, if we're talking Plato, we're going to go from 9 to 11 starting and finish out at uh, 2 to 2.8. Uh, again, same thing we've been talking about. For the extra stout, uh, it's a bigger, it's a little bit bigger beer. We're talking five to six and a half. So this is 1052 to 1062. Uh, it kind of follows suit with all that. And it's going to finish out at 1010 to 1014. Above 1010, we start seeing some body. So 1010 to 1014, we're going to have some body, whereas the other one is quite wispy. Uh, for the, you Plato folks, uh, starting is going to be 13 to 15 and a half, uh, roughly. And uh, it's going to finish out at two and a half to three and a half. Um, uh, uh, Plato, and so that you know, we've all been talking about that. The the Irish stout is not that big of a beer, wonderful to drink, and the extra stout is just the big step above. And so all of these numbers are really showing that when you study this, this is great to memorize. That it's just a step, it's just an overlap, it's just a slight increase in in body and intensity there. But that's uh that that's the vital stats. Awesome. And a great example, if you've made it this far with us and are still listening, is if you start, if you opened the show with a beer, right, and you crack the beer open like Jeremy did, by this time now, your beer has warmed up to my preferred service <laughs> temperature. Uh, and we are here emulating the fact or, or reminding of the fact that uh, Guinness, when they created this style, were emulating cast conditioned ales, which were traditionally served at warmer temperatures. I'm going to love this beer as it warms up and in the in the low 50 degree Fahrenheit range and want that uh, served at a, a little bit warmer temperature to really just showcase more of those beautiful malt aromatics and uh, and flavors that I wouldn't get if the beer was served too cold. And the classic uh, beer glass that you're going to see is in, in a no-nick pint. Um, it's got a little bit of a bulge. Jeremy, if you're watching us and not listening, has that classic glass. The bulge is at the top. Um, it's great for stackability in bars and restaurants. It also helps your hand not slip as much if you start to slip and holding your beer. It's, a, it's just a great glass. It's got a big bulbous mouth, so everything's volatizing out. You get a real chance to kind of get your schnoz in there and smell it very nice uh, and the like. And so with that, though, many people, this is a beer that because it's rich, even though it's more sessionable, you are going to probably find more people eating with food when they are drinking this beer. Jeremy, what what classic food examples or modern food examples would you absolutely want with either of these beer styles? So the the classic uh, it was probably in your book, it's probably in every book about food pairing, is when we're talking Irish stout, you've got to have oysters. You've got to try oysters. Uh, and they are just the, the brininess of the oysters. And, and, and I've done, Julia, trust me, I've done some thorough research on this. That brininess that comes with the oysters, whether and, and w without a sauce, we're talking just pure oysters, which is not appetizing for everyone, but just that brininess, that taste of the sea goes really well with this beer. And there's that old saying that that which goes, uh, grows together, goes together. Well, Ireland is an, is a big Island. And so any seaside, any seafood is going to be great with this. Um, I love this because of the roasty flavors, because of the dryness of the body. I love this with clam chowder, with a pasta carbonara. Uh, it's even great with like, you know, breakfast pastries. Um, uh, in fact, I, and I put this down as a question mark on my list. I would love to try this with a, uh, like a chicken and waffles to see what kind of chocolate and caramel flavors come out of this with that uh, darker roasty flavor. That, I, I bet that would be uh, in, really interesting. What super, about you? Super fantastic. And on that brininess back to the oysters, mm. um, you know, you get a, a sense of salinity from the sea in, in oysters. And that salinity, that salt will help the roast and the bitterness pop more. And so it is a super fun one. You could even mimic it by doing a sensory experiment. Crack your next um, Irish stout or Irish extra stout and, and do a little bump of salt on your pinky. Yeah. Taste, taste the beer. Then take your pinky, do a little lick of salt, and then drink the beer again and see what happens. And that salt's going to make certain flavors brighter, and it's going to really kind of clean up and even enhance the beer, potentiate the beer flavors even more. 
Uh, and and just you know another thing I'd love to pair this with is you know if you're if you're reading some old poetry or some old literature and you're near the coast on a rainy day, this is the beer I want to drink. So it pairs with an environment as well as as food. Well said. And you can have several and not be barreled over and and still be able to get on with your day. So it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I think that kind of brings it out. Longer episode because we did two styles together. We also helped you understand a little bit more background on the nitrogen um, approach to these beer styles and why you're commonly seeing nitrogen as an ingredient in the beer. Um, but go out, go forth, make sure you try several of them uh, over time and different brand examples because they do vary, as Jeremy pointed out. And it's certainly one of the one of the reasons that beer is beautiful. It's art in a glass, and this style confirms that. Yeah, and and by all means, you know, reach out to us, uh, get, go onto our website, and let us know what you prefer. Do you prefer the extra stout? Do you prefer the regular stout? Do you prefer Mur Murphy's over Guinness? I'd love to hear what your experience is and what, and even more importantly, what food you've paired with this that is exceptional. Right Otherwise, on. cheers, or I should say slancha. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Essence of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.